Okay, great. We're live. We'll wait about another minute before we start as we're early, but it looks like we're all set up. Michael Perklin, our special guest is waving. Um, I don't think anyone else is shown on screen at the moment, um, which I think is okay. We can, once we're done sharing the screen, we'll all be up there. Um, but yeah, I'll introduce everyone in one moment. While we're waiting, take a look out a window. Realize how beautiful it is out outside today. That's funny because it's snowing here. <laughs> it's Snow nice is beautiful. It's true, especially when it melts and gets all slushy. <laughs> um, okay, well, so we're going to start. So let's just start by um, introducing ourselves. So because of the screen sharing, only one of us is showing at a time. So I'll introduce everyone and then we can say um, hi as we go. So thanks for joining our live stream today with C4. I'm Jessica Levesque, the executive director. And we have a special live stream today. We're going to be talking about operational security and how to stay safe in the world of crypto. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the two committee members from the Certified Ethereum Professional Committee that are here today. And then we'll talk a little bit about our special guest. So I'm going to start by introducing Cheyenne Eskandari. He is our CEP committee leader. You want to say hello, Cheyenne? Hey, everyone. Um, I'm CTO at Ether Capital and working with C4 for a while. So happy to be here. Thank you, Cheyenne. We're very grateful for you being our committee leader and for being here today. So next up, we have Josh McDougall. Joshua is a board member at C4, and he is also building his own blockchain gaming system. I don't know if I said that correctly, but it's called Slow Ninja, and it is super cool. Would you like to say hello, Josh? Hey, everyone. Happy to be here, as always. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And Josh is also a CEP member and is regularly on the live streams. So let's talk about our special guest today. So Michael Perklin is joining us today. He is the former CTO at Shapeshift, and he is also the president at C4, and he is a board member as well. And he is going to be talking today about operational security. So Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then we'll get started. Thanks, Jessica. Um, yeah, hi everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here on on the live stream. Um, I know that uh, other committee members uh, are on these regularly on Wednesdays, so uh, it, it's a pleasure to to be joining them. Um, as Jessica uh, mentioned, uh, I have the pleasure of being one of the founding members of C4. Joshua and I started the C4 organization back in 2014 when we recognized a gap in. Uh, people's uh, crypto knowledge. Many people would read a, a headline and think they understood Bitcoin, but there wasn't an easy way to actually uh, confirm that they really did understand Bitcoin. So the CBP, the Certified Bitcoin Professional, was born. Um, my history in this space um, uh, comes more on the security side. Uh, for for years, I uh, I operated as a, a as a security consultant, helping large exchanges like uh, Bitfinex or, or uh, uh, Shapeshift deal with breaches and, and prevent breaches from, uh, from occurring. Uh, for the last five years, I served as the Chief Information Security Officer for Shapeshift when Shapeshift was a company. Uh, if you've been following the story of Shapeshift, you'll know that they shut their doors last year, uh, transitioning from a centralized company run by 65 people into a DAO with DAO members all over the world. Um, today, I, I serve as a workstream leader within the Shapeshift DAO, leading the FoxChain initiative. Uh, if you're curious about uh, Shapeshift, you can uh, visit shapeshift.com. But in the meantime, let's talk about security. There's a lot of things that you need to worry about when you're dealing with crypto. And while a lot of it is new, uh, very little of it is difficult. If you think back to the day when you first started using your computer and you had to start dealing with a brand new security measure, a password. Well, in the early days, you didn't know much about passwords. You probably used your dog's name or you used your birthday or some other number that was easily uh, look, uh, look upable like your, your phone number. 
But today, now that we've had some experience using passwords in, in the world, we know a, a lot of uh, tips and tricks for making more secure passwords. They should be unique. You shouldn't use your dog's name and things like that. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the operational security measures for staying safe in the world of crypto, they are um, relatively easy as well. Uh, but if you don't know them, you could get tripped up. So this presentation is going to go through some recommendations for what you can do to your accounts and how you can handle your crypto to stay safe in the crypto world. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Michael Perklin. I uh, founded C4 in 2014 alongside Josh McDougall. Uh, let's talk about a couple things in, in this presentation. First, we're going to discuss spear phishing, which is the most common way that people lose their crypto. We'll talk about data breaches, uh, authentication, crypto keys, and some of the standards that, that C4 is uh, pushing forward and, and what it means for the future. Let's dive in. So as I mentioned, spear phishing is the most common uh, method that people use to target someone. Uh, Basically, if somebody knows that you have crypto, they are going to target you and, and try to take your crypto. This comes in a lot of different forms. Um, I apologize, my uh, screen here has stopped. There we go. Uh, the easiest way to protect against spear phishing is to not be targeted in the first place. There's a difference between regular spam phishing, where they email a million accounts and they don't really target anybody and they hope that they get maybe half a percent of all those uh, participants responding versus spear phishing. I know you have crypto, so I'm going to target you. The best way to prevent it is to simply not be known. If, if you don't uh, need to be vocal in the crypto space. If you don't need to talk about the fact that you hold Bitcoin or Ether or any other cryptocurrency, just don't talk about it. If people don't know you have crypto, they won't target you to steal crypto. Uh, if you have a company that deals in the crypto space, consider hiding your staff's identities where possible. At Shapeshift, when we were operational as a company, uh, we had a program where the very first thing that you did when you started at Shapeshift was you created an alias. Um, you would use that alias for many things throughout your, uh, your, your career at Shapeshift. And through that alias, uh, it was very difficult to identify the real human behind the alias. So uh, try to hide your, um, your identity where possible. There's a technical issue going on here with the slides. I apologize. I do not see the next slide, even though I am clicking. There it is. Uh, looks like we'll have to deal with this. Um, it's probably the interaction of the live stream software and the presentation. So why would you want to use a alias? Well, it's just to be less attractive. If you take a look at the two example emails that are on, on the screen, there was my old email address when I used to work at Shapeshift, michael at shapeshift.io. As soon as you read that, you can tell this person works at Shapeshift. And with a very quick Google, you can find out that, oh, Shapeshift is a crypto company. That means that that Michael guy probably has some crypto. Let me target him. But if you use a John Smith at Gmail, you're going to blend in with a million other uh, people's email addresses, and, um, and, and they're not going to care much about you. As much as you can keep yourself safe, unfortunately, with all the different services that we use, we are regularly giving other services our email addresses. And when they get breached, you become a victim. Uh, it seems like every day there's yet another company that is getting, uh, getting hacked and then their, their database of all their, their customers gets leaked online. And if your email address is in that customer list, you could be a target. Um, these these thieves who who take these these databases they, they look for interesting people they will look for the celebrity names they will look for the people who are tweeting a lot about crypto and they will target them so the moral of the story is don't be interesting when you're signing up on a third party website if you don't already have a alias email account it's super easy to create a free gmail account or yahoo account or hotmail um, with a fake name that is not yours and uh, when in doubt, try using that alias email instead of your own to protect your identity. 
All right, next we're gonna talk about authentication. Now we use authentication every single time that we, um, that we connect to any website. If you're visiting a social media website like Twitter or Reddit, uh, you will have to authenticate and provide a password. Most of these services today offer something called 2FA or two-step verification. Uh, it usually comes in the form of, uh, of a six digit number that you have to type in uh, after you type in the password. Uh, it may come in the form of a, a, a hardware key, but um, having a second step of authentication dramatically improves the protection of your account because malware is everywhere. And luckily computers these days are pretty resilient against malware, but there's always gonna be some other hole that somebody finds tomorrow. And once that one's plugged up, there's gonna be yet another one that comes uh, after that one. People are gonna find ways of uh, spreading malware and spreading viruses. And once you get a virus on your computer, every keystroke that you type can be recorded and beamed back to a remote attacker. If they could see your keystrokes, they can copy all of your passwords. That's why it's important to enable this 2FA because even if they are copying all of your passwords and even if uh, you, you do have malware on your computer that is compromising all that, 2FA makes uh, that malware almost neutralized because they can't get that six digit number from your phone or they can't get that hardware key that you are holding in your pocket. Uh, Jessica, do we, do we have any um, initial questions from the audience? Nope, no questions yet. I'm um, putting some of the acronyms, what you're sharing in the YouTube chat as well. So if anyone's listening on Twitch or Twitter, feel free to ask questions in the YouTube chat or in those chats and we will answer them here. So um, yeah, keep going, Michael. You're doing great. Thank you. Excellent. Let's move on. Um, the, the, the best type of 2FA that you can use uh, is a hardware key. Second best is a very common Google Authenticator. Anybody who has a cell phone can download an app called Google Authenticator. Uh, there's another one called Authy. Both of them are compatible. Um, these allow you to scan funky QR codes like the one I have on the screen here. And once uh, the app has scanned the QR code, they start producing a six digit number that changes every 30 seconds. Uh, this scheme, this 2FA scheme is fairly common across a lot of websites. Uh, every crypto um, website uses this and most email providers use this as well. I strongly encourage you to enable it, um, but something even better is a YubiKey. A YubiKey is a small hardware device that uh, you are able to unplug from your computer and plug in and it, uh, it can store all of these uh, uh, QR codes so that it can produce these six digit numbers for you. What's great about them is that it is completely disconnected from your computer itself. So if your computer does have malware or a virus on it, and that malware or virus um, is looking through your files or it's trying to uh, copy your keystrokes, it, they will not be able to copy anything off of the YubiKey. Uh, it's about 50 US dollars. And I, I, uh, I believe that this is uh, the single best mechanism for protecting your accounts. There's also another type of 2FA, phone-based 2FA. With phone-based 2FA, the provider will send you a text message or they may give a phone call to your phone and an automated system will repeat a six digit number for you. Uh, it's up to you then to, to hear that six digit number and type it into your computer. Never use this. This is one of the most easily hacked methods of 2FA. And through this, um, Many accounts have been compromised and millions upon millions of dollars of crypto have been lost because of phone-based 2FA. It's better to disable 2FA entirely than to have phone-based 2FA. Um, as you are looking through the settings of your account, if there's an option to use a phone or if they ask you, what is your phone number? Just don't type it in. 
If they don't have your phone number, then they won't try to use it as 2FA. Here's a example scenario that I want to walk you through for why phone-based 2FA is so dangerous. In three steps, you can steal someone's Bitcoin. The first thing involves lying to a carrier. You can call up AT&T or Verizon or Rogers or Bell and say that, um, hi, uh, my name is Josh McDougall. Even though I'm not Josh, I tell them I'm Josh McDougall. I got a new phone. Um, here's my postal code that I can look up on Google pretty easily. Here's my birthday that I can look up on Google uh, pretty easily. Uh, please switch to my new phone. My new SIM number is one, two, three, four, five. Um, Bell or Rogers uh, will dutifully change um, the, the SIM card on Joshua McDougall's account. And now I am receiving all of his uh, phone calls and text messages to my handset. And Josh probably hasn't even realized that his phone has gone dead in his pocket. Now I control his phone. Next, uh, I, I know Joshua's email address because I found this online as well. I try to log into Joshua's email account, but I don't know his password. So I click the forgot password button. What happens, Google or whatever the um, email provider is, will send a forgot password uh, text message to the phone. I receive the forgot password text message. I can read it, I can type it in. And now I've, I've told Google that I am Josh and I've changed Josh's email uh, password. Now I control his email. Third and final step is I can go to Coinbase, I can go to Kraken, I can go to any um, of the exchanges that Josh may use, type in his email address and say, I forgot my password. Uh, Coinbase will send an email to Josh's inbox with a reset link. And because now I have access to his email, I have uh, logged into his account. So in three steps, I can take all of his crypto from all, all of his exchanges. This is how millions of, um, of Bitcoin ha have been uh, stolen from many people around the world. Michael, I think it's worth um, just mentioning that somebody in the chat wrote that they can confirm this because they were SIM swapped using a phone carrier. So um, obviously what you're saying is accurate and somebody who is writing has, you know, in the chat has experienced this. So it is something super important to be aware of. Yes. Yeah, so thanks, Jessica. Uh, so this is why it's so important to never use phone based to a FA. If there's a text box to add your phone number to an account, just don't add it. Um, and if you're forced to add it because that's the only thing that the, uh, that the account uses, um, try to add another method of to a FA instead of, of the phone, like a YubiKey or a Google Authenticator. I just wanna add something here, like another point, um... And this is something that I personally went through, like with tech space, if you're traveling a lot, there's a high chance you, that you lock yourself out of your accounts while traveling because you have to figure out the SIM cards. Like a lot of people don't consider that if we're traveling when they have to FA or they don't bring their like YubiKey or other things. That's something to keep in mind that with more security, there's a higher chance that you even lock yourself out of the accounts. So like keep that in mind because that's also a concern. Great point, Cheyenne. Thank you. So that's it about 2FA. Moral of the story is never use uh, your phone number uh, in any capacity for 2FA. You will lose your crypto. All right. There's something that we can do to make it a little bit harder. Now, this is not foolproof, but this does provide some protection. Um, if you call up your carrier and you, you tell them, I want to add a special password to my account, a verbal password. Some carriers support this, not all of them do. Um, you can tell them from now on, I don't want any changes made to my account unless I say the phrase purple monkey dishwasher or whatever phrase that is easy for you to uh, remember. Um, if you add this passphrase, now if somebody does call your carrier and try to impersonate you, the carrier will ask, what is your verbal passphrase? And if the attacker doesn't have it, they won't be able to change it. Now, as great as this may sound, there are a couple of caveats. Number one, not all carriers support it. Number two, some carriers that do support it, the way that it works is just a note on the account. There's nothing that actually tells the, uh, the agent that they must ask and demand a password um, for the caller, but 
as long as that note is near the top of um, of the recent notes, there, there's a good chance that the that the the agent will read it and and say, oh, okay, I'm supposed to ask this person for a password. But once that note gets bumped down from a, a couple of phone calls, they may not enforce it. So you can't rely on this, but it 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 does uh, work great if the carrier supports it. More and more carriers are upgrading their call centers so that now before they get access to any account, they have to actually type in the, the passphrase given by the by the caller. So it, I hope that this becomes more effective over time. All right, let's talk about biometrics. Now biometrics, they look super cool. How many times have we seen a video where somebody's you know putting up their iris or uh, scanning their, their thumbprint or doing something like that to gain access and you hear a futuristic chime and you know access is granted. Biometrics look really, really cool. But cool and secure are very different things. Now, there are three good reasons why you should not use biometrics for anything important. Number one, every biometric identifier that you have is inherently public. Our eyes, uh, are captured on many cameras and live streams like the one I'm doing today. Every time that you hold a glass, you are leaving copies of your fingerprints on it. Um, your, your hand geometry can, can, can be picked up from a couple of uh, photos at long range. Every biometric identifier that you have is public. So it, it, it's as if you're walking around with your password on your forehead. We don't want our passwords to be public so we should not use public things for our passphrases. Number two, every biometric sensor has some kind of an error threshold. Uh, our bodies are always changing. Sometimes um, our, our hands are, uh, have more moisture um, or less. Uh, maybe you've got a small cut on your finger. Maybe you are or you're not wearing your glasses um, or your, your haircut is a little bit different. What this means is, all the sensors that use biometrics, whether it's a fingerprint sensor or a camera that you're looking into, they remember uh, a fuzzy um, uh, initial image. And every time that you scan your iris, they compare it. And as long as it's maybe 85% cl um, close to the original one, well, that's a match. As long as your fingerprint is, well, it's maybe 87% like the same, that's close enough, we'll let you in. Think of a password. If you're going to be typing in a password, oh, you got that maybe 75% right. But the last few characters were way wrong, but no, that's fine. Come on in anyways. We'll, we'll let you in. Passwords don't work like that. So we shouldn't use biometrics um, that, uh, that work like that. Uh, we need to um, have 100% um, confidence in the, uh, the, in the passphrase or, or the, the private information that you're giving to authenticate yourself. Jessica, did you have something to add? Oh, I was going to say it at the end, but I accidentally hit the video. So I'll, after you're done, I have something to add. No problem. So yes, uh, biometric sensors have some error threshold. And because of that, uh, I believe they should not be used for, uh, for authentication at all. The third reason why you should never use bio biometrics is Password revocation is not pretty. Now, if you learn my password, well, I'm gonna go and, and change my password very quickly. If you get a copy of my physical key, well, I'm gonna change the lock on my door so now that physical key doesn't work. But if you get a copy of my fingerprint from a glass, I can't revoke this. I can't just, just take it off. Um, that means that I've got 10, 10 attempts through my entire life to use fingerprint, but all 10 of them can be stolen from me and, and copied very easily. So the fact that you can't revoke it, that you can't turn it off, means that you should never use it in the first place. Um, your password or your, your authentication mechanism needs to be revocable. If you know that someone has gotten access to it, you need the ability to change it. And because you cannot change your biometrics, you should not use biometrics as an authentication mechanism. You want to add something now, Jessica? 
Yes, I do. So there was a Mythbusters episode in 2006, so 14 years ago, that proved this as uh, that biometrics are very easy to um, find a way to get past. And so that was 14 years ago. So we can just sort of imagine that um, it's still a problem, like you're saying, so this hasn't been solved. And then also my sister, who is um, a few years younger than me, and we look similar, but not that similar. There have been multiple times where we can open each other's phone using face IDs. Um, so I feel like we do look alike, but not alike enough that that should be possible. So to your point, point, Michael, it's not exactly your face. Somebody else's face could potentially open it or somebody else's hand or, you know, copying your fingerprint and all of that. So yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Shane, were you about to add something? Um, yeah, I want to say that like some of the, um, like one thing you can use as a biometric is like using it as the 2FA, meaning that um, usually 2FA is like password is something that you know, 2FA is like something that you, that you have. Um, so with these two, you can make sure that you have, you're secure in that sense. So if I haven't seen that many implementation of this to use 2FA, there's a biometric as the 2FA, but I feel like it, that could be something that we see and it could be actually a more practical use of the biometrics. Just something that I've been thinking for a while as a researcher. Yeah, if any of you in the audience are designing a system, maybe you're, you're programming some new uh, NFT marketplace or some new cryptocurrency system. If you choose to use biometrics at all, make, make it uh, act as a username, not as a password. If I scan my finger, It'll put my username in the box immediately, but I still need to type a, a password or I still need to use uh, uh, something else that I only I know. Um, biometrics should be usernames. They should never be passphrases. Next, I wanna talk about probably one of the easiest methods to secure yourself. And that is a password database. A password database, there are many different apps uh, that work as password databases. There is 1Password, there is Dashlane, there is LastPass, there is KeyPass. All these software products are password databases and they dramatically improve your security. They work um, just as a, as a database or a spreadsheet where you can see all of your different passwords and they make it very easy with a single click to uh, create a completely randomized password that uh, is very, very difficult uh, for, for anyone to remember. But because it's stored in the password database, you don't have to remember it. Now, usually when it comes to security mechanisms, they make our lives more difficult. If you're adding 2FA, well, now there's a whole other thing you got to do when you're logging in. If you are... Uh, uh, using any other uh, mechanism to add security, it usually makes your life more difficult. But password databases are a unicorn in the security world. They simultaneously make you more secure, but also they make your life easier. I don't know of any other security mechanism that actually makes your life easier. And that's why I'm such a big fan of password databases. Um, as you're logging into a website, uh, your password database will recognize that, hey, you're about to log into your email. And with a single click, it takes your password, it copy pastes it right into the password box for you. And bam, you're logged in without even having to type a password. So you change typing in some long, complicated password for a single click. It's very easy. Um, and whether your, your password is a short, 10 character password or a mega 128 character password. It's the same copy paste operation. It's the same one click by you. Um, this allows us to have very long, very unique passwords for everything. Now, uh, some people uh, know that, uh, yes, I, I need to use a different password for everything, but I can't remember a different password for everything. So they start using a password algorithm. Uh, some simple examples of a password algorithm would be, oh, I'm logging into the Facebook website. Well, my normal password is ABC123. So for Facebook, 
I'll type in Facebook ABC123. And now when I'm logging into Gmail, I will type my password as Gmail ABC123. And now my password for Gmail is different than my password for Facebook. While yes, they are different on the surface, the reality is if Facebook were to be compromised and their database uh, dumped online, and an attacker were to be able to figure out that your password is Facebook ABC123, it's very simple for them to, to go to your bank and say, oh, well, let's type bank name ABC123. Oh, look, that got me in. Password algorithms are not secure, but a password database makes it very easy for you to have completely different passwords for everything. And all of them are protected by one single password. Shane, would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, so it's interesting that you're saying that, and this is not my, one of my proudest moments, but I was using these kind of patterns before, uh, mostly for my like accounts that I wasn't sure what they are for. Like, um, like it's uh, an example is like Slack when it was a new thing. I just used one of these pattern passwords, and I was using like kind of hard password Slack at the end. Um, <coughs> sorry, and then. Um, later on, Slack was actually a main thing we were using. Um, and funny enough now, but it wasn't funny back then, that someone targeted me, and this, these are all, a lot of them are about the targeted attacks. That someone targeted me, they searched my emails in different password dumps out there. Basically, like if you found like three or four of my password, you could find the pattern, uh, similar to the, your example. And that happened. So. For a few days, I was just getting emails from different platforms that someone is logged into your like account from Belarus or some other countries, and it wasn't it was a tough time to go through all the passwords and reset them. And one thing that helped me get through that much faster was basically password managers or password databases in here, um, and it's a real threat that the example you used is actually real, and I felt it like firsthand, and. Just, and I have a question from you too, as like password databases or password managers. One of the challenges I have is like, I suggest this, but I don't know what, which one to suggest or how people will use it because it also adds a complexity of it. And I would like to hear your opinion on um, sure. how to deal with the usability. Yeah. Um, the four that I mentioned uh, are very good. They, while the user interface is a little bit different, under the hood, they use very strong encryption and um, you'd be well served by any of these four. Uh, one password is one of them. It's the one that I personally use. I, I really uh, find the user interface to be very easy for one password, but some people don't like the way that everything is arranged on one password. And they're big fans of LastPass. There's also Dashlane and KeePass. Uh, one interesting thing about KeePass is that they're uh, software is completely open source uh, for anybody to uh, to look at and run completely independently on their uh, on their computer. What I like about One Password is that if I add a new password on my laptop, uh, it's automatically syn synchronized, um, encrypted to my phone. If I add a new password on my phone, it's automatically synced and in encrypted to my laptop. So no matter where I'm adding a password on which device, it keeps it all in sync. Now, some people don't want that synchronization and they prefer having their password database be an island on their laptop. Um, KeePass is great for that. Uh, any of these services um, would, would serve you well. If you don't have a password database, I would strongly recommend you look into it. But even with a password database, at some point, you're still gonna to have to memorize at least two passwords. At Shapeshift, we taught all of our staff during their security training um, to rely on their password database and to only ever memorize two passwords. Every other password in, in their, their work uh, life could be written into the password database, except for the password they use to unlock their computer because you don't have your password database online yet. So you have to unlock your computer with something you memorize and you have to unlock the password database with something that you memorize. Once that password database is open, now you have all these other passwords at your fingertips, but those two still need to be memorized. So what can you do to simplify memorization? Um, the Mind Palace 
technique is one that I stand behind uh, and I find it very effective. Um, first off, uh, never use a password algorithm like we were talking about earlier. Uh, if you're using the same technique for every one of your uh, websites, then that same technique can be used by an attacker once they, uh, they learn what that technique is. Next, never use anything that could exist on the internet. This includes song lyrics, movie quotes, um, uh, poem, passages from poems, uh, anything that uh, could be written on the internet uh, is likely already loaded into a strong attacker's database that they are using to guess a, a million times a second. So it has to be something that is unique to you. My recommendation is instead of starting with a long complicated password and trying to commit that to memory, instead take an existing memory and turn that into a password. By going backwards from memory to password instead of from password to memory, you make your life a lot easier. Uh, the mind palace technique is, an, uh, is one way to do that. Now, the first example here, this PTQW, this is a randomized password. It's quite difficult to memorize, but the colored one below it, Bobo 3i saxophone pipe 28p open parenthesis window plus rocket. This looks a lot um, easier to remember, but um, for me, this actually has a special meaning. I'd like you to close your eyes and think back to your childhood bedroom. Imagine yourself sitting cross-legged on your, on your bed in your childhood bedroom and you're facing the doorway into your bedroom. What was immediately to the right of the doorway? What was to the right of that? What was behind you? What was um, to the right of that? And if you go around your room, you know, when I was uh, young, I uh, had Bobo the bear sitting on my dresser just to the right of my, my door. There was a third eye blind poster because that was the band that, uh, that was popular at the time. I had my saxophone beside um, the third eye blind poster. And then there was the 28 baud modem and, and my PC. Then there was a window complete with a, a X for the four window panes. And then I had a model rocket kit. So now at any moment, if I wanna remember this password, I can close my eyes, go back to that memory, look around, pick out these features, and each one is a small piece of the passphrase. You can do this with any memory that you have. Do you remember the first time that you, like your, your, your first kiss? Uh, maybe the, the first time that you went to school, uh, when you sat down in your first car, when you, uh, it could be anything that is personal to you. As long as um, it's an existing memory, turn that into a password. Now you can see that um, for the, uh, the first word, I, I just took the name of the bear, Bobo. Um, the second one, a third eye blind poster. Well, I can modify this just to be a three and a capital I. I know that third eye blind, well, that's three I. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, for the PC, I decided to change the C into an open parenthesis. Um, as long as you start with a memory, uh, you'll be surprised at how complicated of a password you can create and how easy it is for you to memorize. All right. Uh, the moral of that story is uh, take an existing memory rather than trying to commit something new uh, to memory. Finally, oh, uh, Jessica, would you like to add something? Before we go on, there's a couple questions in the chat I wanted to bring up. So the first one is, how do you feel about Chrome's internal password manager? Great I mean, question. Um, so a lot of browsers have built-in password managers for them. Uh, while they may be great for websites you're visiting, there's often times where you need to have a password that is not within your web browser. Maybe you're opening up uh, Steam, for example, um, to, to play a game, or maybe you're, you're opening up uh, some other app that has its own username and password field. Uh, whenever you're trying to use one of these apps, if you're opening up um, a web browser just for that, it, to me, it, it feels clunky. Now, I admit I've not reviewed the specific encryption used by Chrome for those passwords, um, but because I had already gotten used to using 
one password in my in my daily life, uh, I actually disable the password managers uh, within my browsers and the password managers um, within iOS um, because I, I use an iPhone um, in favor of the one password password manager that I uh, uh, that I prefer. Um, in general, once you've identified your specific password manager and uh, maybe maybe it is Chrome. Maybe you just love using Chrome and you can look up your passwords easily there in Chrome. I would recommend disabling all the other ones so that you don't end up fragmenting your passwords across multiple different services. It'll make your life a lot easier. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's a great answer. The, the, uh, another question related to that is how about password databases offered by antivirus companies like Kapersky? While I've never personally used that one, I know that there are many more password managers than just the four that I mentioned. I mentioned these four because at, at Shapeshift, when we were still uh, when we were still a company, we did a deep dive into these four, um, understanding the encryption algorithms used underneath, understanding how they were storing and protecting all the passwords, and these were the four that we approved for use at Shapeshift. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other password managers that could also have been approved. Um, it's likely that Kaspersky, a, a company that has a um, well-known and it's a rep reputable brand, it's likely that their password manager is great as well. I just personally haven't reviewed it, so I, I can't vouch for it myself. If you find it useful and it's a brand that you stand behind and, and trust, I would continue using it. I just want to add something here. Michael kind of mentioned this in the past by like the one thing I've noticed, uh, especially trying to get one people in the company to use one password. A lot of them are using either like LastPass or like the Chrome's password manager and like trying to move on here. And having both makes it so complicated to even like add a new password. I mean, it doesn't sometimes save the password, which is more painful. You have to go through recovery. Just as Michael was saying, like choose one and stick with it and disable everything else. So Every time we were typing password, there are no pop-ups. Like they try to make it usable, but when two apps are trying to make the same field usable, it's become like not usable anymore. And just keep one, but keep on keep in mind that like you are basically your password database is stored in within that ecosystem that you're choosing. So if you're using Chrome, try to maybe log in with like um, your Gmail in that Chrome, so it's, it has a backup other than on your computer. Um, if that's something that. Uh, like if Google is the one that you're trusting, one password, personally, what I, how I use it is like, basically I have my own cl like cloud sharing it, but one password now they have their own database to like store it on their cloud, which is fine because that's their own business model. And we can just hope that everything's encrypted and safe, but you can also look into deeper in there. But something that Michael said, and I've seen that within the company is disable everything else, just focus on one and keep all passwords in one. Uh, one um, question I've been asked often while talking about password managers uh, is a very valid one. And I actually had this, uh, this concern myself. Hey, if you're putting all of your passwords into one password database and you're collecting everything into one place, doesn't that just make it a honeypot for an attacker to take that password database? Because now they attack one thing and they get everything. That, doesn't that make it um, less secure? Um, the answer is, in my opinion, it is equal security as the less secure option. Now, if you're only using a single password and you're using, you're repeating that password for everywhere, and someone takes that one password from you that you are choosing to repeat everywhere, they can get access to everything. With a password database, sure, if they get the password database, now they can get in, log into everything everywhere. Those are actually equivalent, but the difference is. If one of uh, those uh, passwords gets breached, because let's say Facebook suffers a password breach, and now your Facebook password is known to an attacker, if they try that Facebook password on your bank website, on your crypto website, on your email website, that's not going to work because you've used a password database to make a unique password for everyone. So the reality is, um, yes, it does make it a honeypot but it is still a more secure honeypot than using the same password repeated for everywhere. Uh, I hope that makes sense. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, you just, I just want to add something there that most of the hacks happen because of leaked passwords and not necessarily your computer being hacked. Like there are some con concerns about like you're win win using a Windows, like outdated Windows machine with a lot of like strangers sending you files. You're a risky um, like, um, group, but most of the people that are getting hacked, their accounts are because some other website that they're using, they used before the database get leaked and their password is reused in other places and that's how they get hacked. So by using that password manager or password database, you're basically removing that attack vector to yourself. And also something that I haven't personally used, but if you wanna really, really be secure, you can always have your own string added to the end of the password manager's password. So you sell like a 2FA on your password. So other than your main password that you're using, a few characters, it could be just like safe. It could be some small, like three, four characters that you can add at the end of every randomly generated password. And with that, you can be like more secure, but it's always comes with the usability factor in mind. So that's something if you wanna like even not trust anyone at all. Um, yeah. Great addition, Cheyenne. Um, early in, the, in this presentation, we talked about 2FA. 2FA is also, uh, a countermeasure against an attacker getting your entire password database. If they are gonna get that password database and they try to log into your email, if your email is configured to require a six digit code from Google Authenticator or a tap from your YubiKey, that, um, even if they do have that password, they're still not gonna get in. So uh, password databases are more secure and they are um, easier to use than any password scheme you can come up with in your mind. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, all right, now let's talk about cryptocurrency wallets. We were talking, or th this uh, presentation is all about keeping your yourself secure online. And if you're gonna be dealing with cryptocurrency, uh, storing Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether, whatever it is you're storing, the safest way to store your crypto is on a hardware wallet. Whether it's a keep key, a ledger, or a trezor, or some of the other newer ones that I personally haven't tried yet, um, a hardware wallet is designed to keep your crypto keys off of your computer. Now, when you're using some kind of a, a cryptocurrency app on your computer, let's say uh, MetaMask or uh, Exodus or some uh, program that uh, lets you deal with your crypto, those programs will store your keys on the hard drive of the computer. And the moment that your computer gets malware, gets a virus, uh, or an attacker gets access to that computer, they will be looking uh, in all the common places where MetaMask stores its password, Exodus stores its password, all these software apps store their password, and they will copy it, and now they've stolen your crypto. With a hardware wallet, like a key key, a ledger, or a trezor, there is no key on your computer to begin with. Uh, so even if your computer is compromised with malware and they're looking through every bit on your hard drive, they will not find your crypto key because it's not there in the first place. That's the biggest enhancement that a cryptocurrency hardware wallet provides. Um, and what's great is most of them these days uh, conform to known standards. Um, these technical standards, BIP32, BIP39, BIP44, um, you don't need to know exactly what those are, but uh, if your hardware wallet supports one of these standards, you can take your keys off of one, load it up onto another. If it gets broken or destroyed and you replace your key, key with, with a ledger, um, your, your funds will be safe. Now, tomorrow, C4 is going to be hosting another live stream with a hardware wallet expert. Josh Datko uh, is uh, well known and well respected in, in the space for his uh, hardware knowledge. And this presentation uh, that I've given today uh, is basically security light. If you are interested in diving deeper into hardware wallets and, and how to uh, use them for your own uh, benefit, I strongly encourage you to show up to C4's live stream tomorrow to hear Josh Datko speak. Um, Whenever you are using a hardware wallet, you need to write down 12, 18, or 24 words in order to back things up. If you are writing these words down um, using a pen, 
if there's a flood that uh, puts water all over your uh, your 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 piece of paper, that ink could run and and be illegible. If there's a fire, that piece of paper can burn, and now your your crypto uh, goes up in smoke. But there are fireproof, floodproof um, steel devices that you can use to make sure that they uh, that your C survives a fire and it survives a flood. Uh, I personally stand behind the crypto steel brand of products, but it's essentially just a, a, a piece of steel that you encode your, your words in. Um, any kind of steel, as long as it... Um, is real steel and, and not something that can uh, melt at much lighter temperatures. Any kind of steel will survive a fire and, uh, and a flood. Um, I also recommend uh, spend 30 bucks um, to get some tamper evident bags. A tamper evident bag looks, looks like this. Um, it's, uh, it has a, a tamper evident seal that makes it very difficult uh, for someone to open the bag and uh, and look inside without uh, breaking that seal. Now, these tamper evident bags, they're not going to prevent someone from looking at your seed, but uh, they will deter it because if somebody just gets a uh, three seconds with your uh, with your your backup seed, they can very quickly take a photo of it, and now they can steal your your crypto later on that evening. All, all they need is maybe two seconds to take a photo of it. But if your seed is stored in one of these tamper evident bags, uh, they know that if they were to rip open that bag uh, to try to take a photo, you will immediately uh, see that the, the bag has been ripped open. So it's more of a, a, a deterrent from um, crimes of opportunity than it, it will stop someone from getting it at all costs. Uh, here are some other photos of a uh, hardware wallet. This is a, a keep key on the left. Uh, for you non-technical uh, audience members, the keep key is the most user-friendly way to deal with the most common cryptocurrencies. Um, if you are dealing with less common cryptocurrencies or if you want to uh, uh, tinker a lot more, I would recommend a ledger or a treasure in place of a keep key but the ledgers and treasures are more complicated to use than a keep key. Uh, at the top right here, that is a crypto steal. Uh, it comes with uh, dozens of all the different letters in the alphabet, and you slide your letters in one at a time to build your 24 word phrase. Uh, this piece of slab will not melt in fire. Uh, and there's an example, tamper evident bag at the bottom right. So once you are using a hardware wallet, uh, the, the key thing that makes it uh, effective is the fact that your keys are not typed, on, uh, typed into the computer. Once you've got your, your hardware wallet set up, you have, to, you have to take care to never ever enter your seed, enter those words on any website. If you catch yourself typing your seed phrase on a keyboard, whether it is a phone keyboard or a computer keyboard, immediately stop. You should never have to type it. You should never have to enter it anywhere. Uh, all hardware wallets allow you to type the, the, the key directly onto the hardware device or using some kind of a keyboard cipher. So you're not typing the real letters on your keyboard um, in order to get it onto the device. Uh, and of course, never show those words to anyone ever either. Uh, if someone gets a copy of those words, they've stolen all the crypto that you own. Finally, actually, before I start, uh, Jessica, do you want to have something to add? Yes. Um, so in the chat, somebody brought up the question about how do you leave private keys for loved ones in case of sudden death? And I think this is, um, we can do probably a live stream on this at another time, but I do want to yes. mention that there are resources out there. Pamela Morgan, one of our board members, she has a book and a workshop, Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning, A Simple Guide for Owners. And that gives a lot of tips on how to secure your crypto and then also 
um, secure it in a way that others will be able to access it after you're gone, but not before. It's, I think it's a really useful read, but we'll, I think that's a good question and we'd be happy to do a follow-up live stream on that sometime. So thank you for bringing that up and we'll make sure that we address it further at a later time. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I also uh, recommend Pamela, Pamela Morgan's uh, book on inheritance planning. It's a, a, a fairly small book, it's a short read, uh, but very effective. Um, the last thing that I will mention is the cryptocurrency security standard, which was a initiative spearheaded by C4. Um, a lot of the advice that has been listed here uh, that I'm uh, targeting to you as individuals has been formalized as advice for businesses. If you are working at a company that is holding crypto uh, or it, uh, if you're working at a crypto company, I encourage you to take a look at the cryptocurrency security standard. You can find it on C4's own website. Um, it's published open for everyone uh, to use, and it, uh, it it acts like a like a checklist. Uh, there are 33 uh, controls that are listed in the cryptocurrency security standard, and depending on how many of those 33 controls your business has implemented, you can be graded as insecure, level one, level two, or level three. It's rare for any company to reach level three. Uh, as long as you've reached level one of CCSS, you are secure. Sure, level two is more secure than one and level three is more secure than two. But um, uh, at a bare minimum, your company should be able to attain level one. Um, we um, can can provide a, a, a online workshop for this at uh, some future point as well. With that, I'd like to open up the floor for any uh, specific questions that you have, either about some of the security measures uh, we've talked about here or any other security uh, question you have uh, burning in your mind. The floor is yours. Uh, so Jessica, bring, if you could relay, uh, that'd be helpful. Yep. Thank you. Yep, so I'll bring something up that was also in the chat, which is um, somebody was saying that they have joined a Telegram group um, to learn about key up-to-date security features. And I guess I think it'd be useful, Michael, if you would talk a little bit about how someone can keep um, up-to-date with security features and like, is there any good place to do so? Because obviously even experts in the space and with this content, content shouldn't always be trusted about everything, right? You need to do your own research. So do you have any advice on how people can do that? Uh, I do. Um, actually, what you brought up, um uh sparked another uh, thought of uh, uh, of a red flag so telegram and discord are two uh chat programs that are very common in in the cryptocurrency space now the moment you join a telegram group um dedicated to a specific cryptocurrency let's say it's a a group of bitcoin fans or a group of cosmos enthusiasts or a group of ethereum um developers there are attackers who are looking at the membership list of all of these crypto groups. They rightly assume that if you are in a Bitcoin group, you probably own some Bitcoin. If you are in an Ethereum group, you probably own some Ether. So there are bots that um, will pretend to be uh, Bitcoin support or um, uh, they, they provide help to people who are um, having issues with their cryptocurrency. Um, you will notice if you are using Telegram or Discord uh, and you are in one of these cryptocurrency groups, you are going to be invited to brand new groups without your, your notice. You're going to be contacted with direct messages from, uh, from people you've never met who will just start, oh, hi, oh, uh, I'm from here. These are scammers. They are looking to start a dialogue with you, and eventually they uh, want to help you invest in cryptocurrency. All you got to do is click here on this link. All you got to do is type your mnemonic on that website, and then you can buy this new coin at cheaper than market rates. All of this is a scam. You should be aware that uh, you will get direct messages from people the moment you are in these groups. So that was not an answer to the question that was asked. But if you are a member of any Telegram group, especially a, a group that is uh, uh, giving security advice, be wary 
that some of the people in that group and some of the people that contact you will not have your interests at heart. Um, above all else, remember the advice, never enter your mnemonic seed on any website and never show it or give it to anyone ever. Um, now, how to stay up to date with security practices. Um, this is a more um, difficult question to, uh, to answer than others because there are people who are out there uh, purporting to give you security advice, but actually it's insecurity advice. Uh, and unless you um, have a, a long history with security, it may be difficult for you to tell the difference between the two. Um, when in doubt, I would um, rely on the people in your life that you already know and trust, uh, specifically the ones you already trust. Chances are you have someone in your family, friend, group, whatever, who uh, knows more about IT than others. Uh, if you ever read a piece of advice and are unsure, talk to them about it. Um, if you reach out to, um, to, to C4 on Twitter with a specific question, uh, we can provide uh, an answer, but um, everything all depends on the very specific nuances of that new piece of advice. Uh, I'd like to ask um, Joshua if uh, he has any um, other advice for how to tell if um, or how to keep up to date with uh, with security practices. Um, I mean, those are those are you know good things to start with. If, if you want to keep track of of certain products and services, certainly, uh, let's say you want to you know keep an eye on your treasures or ledgers. Um, they usually have uh, very good documentation in their open source repositories, um, in their corporate blogs. But you know, to Michael's point, make sure you're actually on that that uh, service or, or product's website and, and not a copycat. Um, we have seen uh, certainly, especially with say Discord and Telegram scams, basically entire infrastructure set up to look like they're sending you to the to the website or, or service that you're familiar with um, and and even mimicking entire teams of support and executives uh, all with people with with very similar names and things like that in these services and they do a wonderful job of faking it so make sure you're looking at the at the ledger site or the treasure site that, that you know and trust um, there are many research uh, teams in the space that are also absolutely excellent in putting out really interesting research um, I think off the top of my head, I would want to uh, give a shout out to Kraken's research team does does just wonderful work in the space to do research on on, say, hardware wallets or, or different services and and uh, networks and 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 do great write ups and, and, and frequently publish that support. So I would definitely give a, a shout out to the Kraken team and, and make sure you uh, take a look at their research. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure other teams in the space um, are also putting out uh, really, really valuable information on the open source side of things. You know, a lot of these networks are, are open source networks, be it the Bitcoin network, the Ethereum network, Cosmos. Um, all of this is is generally run by a lot of open discussion. Um, so being involved in those projects, you know, if you want to follow Bitcoin and understand the, the very, um, you know, up to date details on, on that network then the, there's some mailing lists you can join um, if you want to be up to date in the cosmos space uh, there's some really interesting discord servers that you can join with with wonderful discussions so basically uh with with the crypto space you know being being involved in the specific projects that interest you is is really the best way to get a good good handle on on exactly what's going on in those spaces yeah those, those were both very helpful answers did you have anything else on this, Michael? Or I have one last question before we go. No, oh, I, I realize that we're a couple minutes over. So let's get one, one last question in. Thanks, Jessica. Yep. So um, somebody was wondering about the CCSSA. So you brought up the standard. And I want to make sure everyone knows that the standard is out. It's available. It exists. Um, and Michael, as a member or or Joshua, as a member of the CCSS steering committee, perhaps you could answer that question about what the ETA is on our plans to finalize the CCSSA um, certificate. That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, so for those who don't know, the CCSSA or the CCSS auditor um, uh, designation, um, that is a, a, a test you can write that proves that you understand the CCSS thoroughly. 
It's, it's uh, somewhat similar to the CBP that proves you know Bitcoin or the CEP that proves you know Ethereum. Um, the, the, this certification has um, run into quite a lot of roadblocks over the last few years, uh, largest one being COVID. Uh, the current last hurdle that is, uh, that is facing the, the launch of the CCSSA is one uh, legal hurdle. Um, last I, I heard from the committee, the legal hur hurdle has been uh, jumped just last week. Uh, so uh, as soon as possible, I guess is my answer. Um, it, it's coming. Great, thank you. Yes, so we're very excited. It will be out soon. And um, thank you all for joining today. This has been very informative. It's super important to take the time to learn about how to be more safe and secure, particularly online. And if you're trying to use crypto, it is very important to know what these best practices are and to follow um, kind of the, the expert's advice while doing your own research on what is some, what is the best way to be safe and secure so you don't lose what you've worked hard to obtain. So Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about operational security with us today. Thanks for having me. And um, Joshua and Cheyenne, thank you both for being here. And um, please join us tomorrow for another live stream on Crypto Wallets 101. We have Josh Datko joining us and it should be a great live stream. So hope to see you there and thanks for joining today. Bye everyone.